We all know how important it is to keep our bones strong and healthy as we age, but equally important is to keep our brains healthy and our minds sharp. And we want to do everything we can to prevent Alzheimer's and dementia. And the good news is there's so much we can do. And that's what we're going to delve into today with our special guest, Dr. Robert W.B. Love, who's a PhD and he's a neuroscientist and entrepreneur. And he has one of the most watched TikTok channels on neuroscience and preventing Alzheimer's disease with over 1.1 million followers and 100K followers on Instagram. Currently, Dr. Love is principal investigator in a clinical trial investigating the effects of Huperzine A on memory in both healthy adults and those with early stage memory loss. And Dr. Love is full of great information that he shares with us about what we can do, actual steps we can take, as well as different supplements that have really been shown to improve memory and help keep our brains strong and keep our brains healthy as we age. So today's full of lots of great information. Stay tuned. Welcome, Robert. I'm so happy to have you on the podcast. You Thank know, we've you, been talking about this for a while. And I'm just so glad you're coming on because this topic is so important. And I think you can really enlighten all of us with all your great information. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. So before we even get started, because this topic is important as it is, but just recently, I mean, this is in 2023, uh, in the Journal of Neurology, an article, Association of Bone Mineral Density and Dementia. And they found a correlation between low bone density and earlier onset and dementia. So this, so it's interesting. They're not sure why, and they're investigating it, but it's, you know, it was just, I thought maybe some of the root causes are similar, but what you're going to shed light on is just so important. So why don't we start with, you know, just in general about, about Alzheimer's and dementia and what people really don't know. Let's start with, you know, what it is and where we can go, because you're going to, you know, there's a lot we can do. And I think that's, what's so wonderful about about the information you're going to present with us. Okay, terrific. So first I want people to know, so I'm a neuroscientist. I'm not a medical doctor and I'm not giving you medical advice. Please consult your medical doctor before doing anything that affects your health. And um, my, my job here is I just want to do my best to try to explain the science so that people can make um, healthier choices and live happier, healthier lives. Um, and so I may, I may mention supplements or things that help build bones or, or help protect the brain. Uh, but if you are on pharmaceutical drugs, if you are uh, taking prescriptions, you want to check with your pharmacist and medical doctor for any interactions and so forth. So I just, I just want people to be safe. Everyone's heard of Alzheimer's and it's really scary. And, and there's just so many things people don't really know about it. So why don't you put it like simplify what it really is? Yeah. And so Alzheimer's is a loss of memory. Um, and this, this is the best, the best simplification I have. Anything that impairs memory, generally speaking, increases the risk of Alzheimer's disease. On the other side of the coin, anything you can do to improve your memory can reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease. And so, um, so it's important to know that there are activities you can do. Exercise is, is number one. Exercise improves memory. Exercise actually improves brain volume and actually increases the size of your brain. There's research from Dr. Kirk Erickson and colleagues from the Uni University of Pittsburgh showing that older adults who did it's like 30, 45 minutes of exercise five days a week um, had larger brains, uh, specifically the hippocampus, the memory center of the brain, compared to the group that did stretching for 30 to 60 minutes, five days a week. Um, and so exercise actually grows a bigger brain specifically in the memory center of the brain, the hippocampus. That's pretty cool. Um, and so that can help reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease. So if you're not exercising, you're really missing out on some free, you know, it's the best thing you can do for your health. Um, it's not the preferred method of weight loss. Weight loss is really more of a dietary issue. Um, but I'm not saying don't exercise if you want to lose weight, but don't use that as your tool for weight loss. Use that as your tool for health, for healthy living, your tool for just feeling really good. I don't know about you, Margie. I don't feel well. Uh, I don't feel as good when I don't exercise. Oh, oh, I totally agree. I mean, exercise is non-negotiable in my life. And, you know, if, and, and I really make it a priority no matter what, but there were times, or there are times when I'm not exercising as much and it makes such a difference really in every aspect of my life. And it's so important for our bones. So it's sort of a win-win. You're helping your bones and you're helping your brain. So, oh, absolutely. I, I, so I love that. You know, before we go any further, 
Robert, I just, why don't you just share why you as a neuroscientist got so interested in working in this area, you know, with Alzheimer's and dementia. You want to just share your story? Cause I, yeah, I love hearing the backstory because, you know, it tells me why you're so passionate about the work you do. Yeah. So I, I did my dissertation on ADHD and attention. And so I compared, this was fun, exercise versus Adderall versus coffee. Which one, which one had the best performance on a math test? Which one do you think <laughs> won, Margie? So wait, Adderall, let's go again, coffee, Adderall, then, what was the third one? Exercise. That's interesting. I mean, I'd like to say exercise. Is that true? Yeah, exercise crushed. Oh, it, yeah, it, just, yeah. It, it was by <laughs> far the most effective way of improving uh, performance on this test and oh, we have to get that out there. That's so interesting. <laughs> yeah. E yeah. Exercise is by far just one of the best things you can do for your, for your attention. Um, and so I was in the ADHD space. I have ADHD myself and, um, I was doing some coaching in that area, working with children and adults to help them, uh, help them function and Im improve their work performance and school performance. And then I went to my parents' house and, um, my mother was having a uh, back surgery. And so I offered to stay at my parents' home for a couple months to, uh, to help my mother as she recovered and um, help around the house. While I was there, I noticed my parents' memory was not as good as it, as it had been. And this was of concern for me because I have two grandparents who had dementia. One had Alzheimer's disease, one had dementia unspecified. Um, and so I was concerned about them. And I noticed, uh, I, and so, at that point, I really started getting into the dementia research, the Alzheimer's research. And I learned there's a ton of things, um, a ton of progress has been made since you know my grandparents had Alzheimer's when, or my grandfather had Alzheimer's and we didn't know anything. We just thought it was all genetic and there's nothing to do about it. The current science is really impressive. There are so many things uh, you can do to help improve your memory and reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease. I started getting, getting into that research. And I thought I'm, I'm changing course here. Uh, I'm not going to do ADHD. I'm moving um, into Alzheimer's prevention. And the most important people are my parents. And so I got them to clean up their diet. I got rid of the bad chocolate, tried to put in some healthy chocolate, reduce the sugar, reduce the carbs, and um, encourage them to exercise. My dad's great at exercise. My mother, she's working on it. And, uh, and they're doing great. And so that's, that's what kicked off this, this, this passion for me of helping people prevent Alzheimer's disease. Oh, well, that's great. I mean, I, I think it's so empowering because it is very scary. And, you know, no one wants, when you think about your future, that's the one place you don't want to go. So if there's things you can do, you know, right now, that's just wonderful. And, and interesting, the things that you said are all things that are really just good for your overall health and your bones as well. So it's just a win-win for everything. So let's go to the supplements because you found and you've done so much research on this and you even created your own supplements that, you know, there are certain supplements that can really make a difference in terms of your brain. Absolutely. And now I want to say supplements are not a substitute for exercise. Supplements are not a substitute for a good diet. <laughs> supplements are not a substitute for sleep. If you're not exercising, if you're not eating a healthy diet, if you're not sleeping, supplements aren't going to help. I mean, they might help a little bit. They're better than, you know, not doing anything, but I would start with the exercise and sleep and the diet and then early morning sunshine, getting, getting outside. Basically, as soon as you wake up within 10 to 30 minutes is, is optimal. I'm, I'm outside with my jogging shoes on within 10 minutes of waking up, maybe 11. Um, but if you can be outside within 30 minutes, getting early, getting sunshine in your eyes, don't look directly at the sun, but just being out in the sunlight that helps stimulate your circadian rhythm or set your circadian rhythm, which improves memory, mood, attention during the day. And that can really just, that creates a great day and creates a virtuous cycle and improves your sleep and all kinds of things. So doing those, those things, super important. Um, and How many I know people minutes then go back to that? How many minutes yeah. outside in the sun? No sunglasses. Just yeah. So I want to cite the work of Dr. Andrew Huberman, a neuroscientist at Stanford. He shared this in his podcast. Um, and so getting outside a minimum for 10 minutes in the sunshine, when we wake up, ideally within an hour of waking up sooner, the better helps set our circadian rhythm for the day. If you consider our ancestors, our ancestors, let's say they slept in uh, some sort of shelter or a cave. And then they got outside and it was likely light when, as soon as they woke up and went outside and they were outside pretty much all day. And then the sun went down and then there were the stars and light from the moon and, and fire, right? If, when they had fire, um, we live in a very artificial environment now 
where we, uh, we stay inside for a lot of the day. We're not exposed to sunlight during the day. And then at night we turn on artificial lights. I have some artificial lights above me and right, right in front of me here. Um, these are different than sunlight. These affect our eyes differently than sunlight. I think uh, Peter Atia shared this. I think it's research in China showed that um, spending too much time in front of the screen is really hurting children's eyes. This is just a little side note about why it's so important to be outside. They found if children were outside playing more, they had better vision because one, they're in the sunlight. Number two, they're looking at things from different distances. Whereas you and I are going to be looking, you know, what is this? Two feet, three feet from between here and my, my camera. That doesn't use, use our eye the way our ancestors would use it when hunting and gathering and you know, chasing children around, looking for firewood and so forth. Um, so just being outside and walking, terrific for your eyes as well, but it helps set your circadian rhythm. And this serves as an anchor point for, for health because then your body knows when to go to sleep and it knows when to wake up and it becomes regular. And imagine how much, um, imagine how much help our ancestors had going to sleep at the right time. It was dark and there was no phone. There was nothing to keep them up, right? Except, you know, I guess they were dancing by the fire or socializing, but very easy to fall asleep at night. My, I, I have friends who camped in the Grand, was it the Grand Canyon. They said it was just so easy to go to sleep as soon as the sun went down. So there's nothing else to do. Um, us, it's really easy to stay up, which really, I think it's the poor quality sleep we're experiencing is certainly increasing. Uh, it's, it's certainly hurting our memory. It's increasing brain fog in younger people. Uh, I think it's increasing uh, attention deficit disorder or reported cases of attention deficit disorder. And it's increased the risk of Alzheimer's disease. If you're not sleeping, you're not making new memories. Um, if you don't sleep for 48 hours, you won't have memories from those 48 hours. Um, I, I attend the, the Burning Man uh, event, which is a terrific event. And I know some people that like to stay up for a couple of days. I say, look, if you do that, you're not going to remember what happened during those days. Mm -hmm. So not only is this just not a good idea, and I don't think it's very safe to not sleep. Uh, if you're going to make sure you get sleep so you can have those memories, so sleep is just essential. Um, and so before we get into the supplements, I just want you to like really anchor this in the sunshine, the exercise, the diet, the sleep, and then relationships. Um, women know this better than men do. Uh, a bad relationship, whether it's a romantic partnership or trouble with a child or trouble at work, it can really hurt us and it, it hurts our health. Um, on the other hand, great relationships, nurturing relationships, loving relationships, healthy relationships improve our health. They lift us up, they protect us during difficult times, and, and they, they, they're a really wonderful part of life. Um, and so improving your relationships is a great way uh, to not only improve your overall health, but reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease. You know, it's so interesting because that Harvard study that they did, you know, people for over 80 years, that the most, it's still amazing to me, the most important thing, they looked at every possible, you know, they had people's blood work. They looked at so many different lab values on, on these men for a very, for a period of time. And they found the most important thing was the relationships to, to the type of life you lived, how long you lived. And so, yeah, it's so very important, but it's interesting in terms of Alzheimer's that that's a big part of it as well. Yeah, just for overall health. I mean, to make to really broad strokes, anything that's good for your health can help reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Because if you're healthier, you're likely to exercise. If you're healthier, you're likely to eat right. You're likely to get the nutrients your brain needs to be healthy and to thrive. Um, you're more likely to make better decisions. You're more likely to get your sleep. And so just being healthy helps reduce the risk of this as well as pretty much um, most, most diseases. And so optimal health is really what you wanna aim for. And that in turn will reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so win-win for all of us. <laughs> so I'll start with, with one that there's just a lot of research behind that, that I've been taking that um, it's shocking to me that more uh, gerontologists don't recommend this. There's a lot of data on this. I recommend you look up some of these papers and print them and bring them to your a gerontologist or your uh, primary care doctor and say, what do you think about this? And then um, you know, ask them to review it and then see if it's safe for you. It likely is. And then also ask them if they'll recommend it to their other patients because you know, it's Dr. Stephen Gundry said, I learn more from my patients than they learn from me because they'll bring research papers to him. They'll bring questions to him that'll, that'll allow him to help his other patients better. So you can help educate your doctor by printing the research and offering it to, to them and, and asking them to review it and then potentially use this in their practice. So the first supplement that I, that I would talk about um, that's really great is curcumin. Curcumin is from the Indian root turmeric. Um, curcumin has so many tremendous benefits 
for the body and for the brain. Uh, first, it's anti-inflammatory. And so inflammation is one of the primary risk factors of Alzheimer's disease. The Framingham study in Massachusetts is a longitudinal long-term study. And what they found is your levels of inflammation at age 40 predict your, predict your risk of Alzheimer's at age 70. So they're predictive 30 years in the future, which means it's a good idea to reduce inflammation today. Maybe think about it and then start tomorrow, but you want to start right away reducing chronic inflammation and curcumin helps do that. Um, curcumin also, so, and, and that, so that's not only protective of the body, but protective of the brain as well. It's neuroprotective. Uh, something else that curcumin does is it actually helps prevent the accumulation of plaque in the brain, the amyloid plaque in the brain, the hallmark sign of Alzheimer's disease. Um, so they, they gave rats or mice Alzheimer's disease, and then they gave them either curcumin or, or saline or, you know, or, or nothing. And then they looked at the mice and they found that the mice given curcumin had less plaque in the brain. Uh, you know, Dr. Dale Bredesen, who wrote a great book, I'd recommend this to all of you, The End of Alzheimer's Program. Uh, it details steps you can take to reduce the risk of Alzheimer's and even how to improve re reverse cognitive decline. If someone's already losing their memory with Alzheimer's, this can help reverse that cognitive decline. Um, and so he, he talks about how curcumin will bundle up the, the plaque. It'll, it'll, it'll help prevent it from forming. Even cooler, I think, it'll actually remove plaque. And so let's say you have a level, let's say a person has a level of 10 plaque in their brain. They take curcumin for six months. Six months, they have, might have a level of eight or seven or six. Um, I don't know the exact numbers, but it actually can help reduce the accumulation of plaque pot potentially by protecting the brain from inflammation. We don't know the exact mechanism. At least I don't know the exact mechanism. Um, so curcumin, really tremendous. And then this is my, my final, final bit on curcumin. This is really cool. So they, they, they made mice obese by feeding them a high sugar, high fat diet, basically the standard American diet, right? And they gave half of them curcumin, half of them nothing. And then, and then they dissected them. What they found was that the mice given curcumin had healthier organs. They didn't weigh less but their organs were healthier. Their heart, their kidneys, their lungs were healthier. How is that possible? Well, obesity is inflammatory. Obesity increases inflammation in the body and that can harm the organs. And so their curcumin actually protected the organs in these obese mice. Well, that's great. And is there a certain, I know there's various different types of curcumin that you can purchase. Is there a certain amount that you recommend? I know yeah, again, you're not a doctor and you're not, you're not prescribed, but in general, do you have some guidelines? Yeah, here's what to look for. I recommend um, about a thousand milligrams a day with black pepper or piperine or biopiperine or bioparine. Um, so black pepper increases the absorption of curcumin. This is very important. So in research studies, they found that including black pepper with curcumin increases the absorption by up from 300% up to 3000%. So 3X to 30X, a tremendous uh, difference in the bioavailability of curcumin. Basically, curcumin is expensive and it's notoriously difficult to absorb. Uh, ways to increase the absorption are take it with a little bit of fat. So, you know, a little spoon, a little bit of uh, coconut oil, MCT oil, maybe a little avocado, have it with some fat that'll increase absorption. And then most good curcumin supplements will have some black pepper in them. And that, um, that, can, that increases absorption as well. So a thousand milligrams of curcumin, and then at least five milligrams up to 10 milligrams of um, black pepper. That's, that's a, that's a good, that's a good amount. Is there anyone who has to be careful if they have blood clotting issues or are there other people that you would say, you know, again, always ask your, your healthcare yeah, provider. That's a good question. But... I don't, I don't know any in particular. Um, who, who, who curcumin is not safe for. Okay. Okay. So let's so curcumin. That's a great one. There's so much research on that as well for so many, and inflammation so, so is a big problem it, with osteoporosis. And, you know, in, when there's inflammation, it increases the activity of the, of the osteoclast, the cells that are destroying bone. So curcumin also has another benefit in that reducing inflammation and, you know, so yeah, so I think that's great. Next, I have, I have kind of a controversial one. Controversial because the research is so interesting 
and it's it's relatively hard to find, but uh, it's it's really powerful. Um, it's called aniracetam. It's spelled A N I R A C E T A M. Aniracetam, and this is this is a pharmaceutical drug. If you're in Europe, uh, you need a prescription for it. In the United States, it is available without a prescription, but it is it is difficult to find. Now, this is one you want to check with your doctor because it does have counterindications. Specifically, um, aniracetam slightly thins the blood. And so if someone's on blood thinners like warfarin, um, you want to, you want to check with your doctor. The doctor will probably say no, because they likely don't know aniracetam or its benefits. Um, but it's, it's, it's important to check. So aniracetam is very cool. It increases a, the action of a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine, acetylcholine. This is a neurotransmitter involved in memory. Uh, in the hippocampus in the brain. It's also involved in motor movement. This is my attempt at motor movement. Um, <laughs> and so uh, acetylcholine, very, it's a very important neurotransmitter. Um, and so interesting side note, drugs that block acetylcholine increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease. So bladder control drugs, um, Benadryl. Uh, people, the research shows that people who take drugs that block acetylcholine for four months or more excuse me, six months or more have a 40% increased risk of Alzheimer's disease, older adults. Well, so if someone's- what, So other, what other ones? That's very interesting because a lot of people are taking bladder control medication. Yeah, so, so there's, 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 there's too many for me to go through the list and, and try to memorize them. Uh, what you wanna do if, you're if someone is taking prescription drugs and they don't know what they do, it's important to ask the pharmacist Pharmacists are generally speaking, have more information than medical doctors on these, and they're also more accessible. And ask your pharmacist, does this drug affect acetylcholine? If so, how? If it does, and if it reduces acetylcholine, you can ask, is there a safe alternative that will also be effective that won't reduce acetylcholine? And then it's a discussion with your doctor and pharmacist, what's gonna be best for, for that individual. Uh, but the research is pretty clear that taking drugs long-term that block acetylcholine, not only imp impair your memory, uh, but they increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease by approximately 40%. And so um, again, this, this simple, the simple broad strokes I painted at the beginning, anything that improves your memory helps reduce the risk of Alzheimer's. Things that impair your memory increase the risk of Alzheimer's and blocking acetylcholine does increase the risk of, uh, does impair memory in many people and can increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Will it say that on the product insert? I don't can know. Effect, that'll be interesting. Can they, I don't, you know, I, I don't know. Yeah, I remember when, when it, you may have had this experience. I remember taking Vyvanse for my ADHD and it said may cause heart attack and sudden death. And I remember reading this and I, I was sitting at the, at, at the, at the pharmacist counter. Cause that was the first time I, I had it. And I, I said, is this right? This can cause <laughs> sudden death. It's like, oh yeah. A bunch of them say that. I said, really? This, this is all right. Yeah. It's a really uh, good point. Cause there's so many side effects sometimes that people just sort of ignore it, you know, like, oh yeah, they have to write that on everything. And so they just move on and don't realize something. Wow. You know, that would be how I sad mean, to be on a medication and then find out that it 40% increased your risk of developing Alzheimer's. Yeah. It wow. would be helpful if these warnings were written in a way that were helpful to people. Yeah. So saying this can cause sudden death, clearly that did not deter me from taking it. Now I don't still take Vyvanse, but I took it then. Um, and the pharmacist had no problem with it, nor did my doctor. Um, so that warning isn't necessarily very helpful um, if indeed it does cause those things. What would be helpful is, is percentages, you know, in our, in our studies, X amount of people experience this negative side effect. That would be helpful but for us to determine, ooh, do, do I want to take this, right? What, what's, what's the trade-off? Wow. Um, so, so we're talking about the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. Uh, bladder control drug, some bladder control drugs and Benadryl block acetylcholine and they can impair memory and increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Aniracetam increases uh, acetylcholine activity or cholinergic activity. And so this can help improve memory. Aniracetam also has other great positive benefits of it reduces depression, reduces anxiety. It may help um, protect the brain from amyloid plaque accumulation. Um, 
that hasn't been studied directly, but in, that's a research paper I'm, I'm submitting. Uh, I've, I've, I've read a number of different journal articles and they suggest that the, the different biochemical processes of anorastium may actually prevent plaque in the brain, which would be really, really cool. Um, and it also just improves mood and, and it improves memory in healthy adults and it, it helps uh, improve memory in those with early stage Alzheimer's disease. So it does a lot of really beneficial things. So here's some of the research on this. In a double-blind placebo-controlled study out of Italy, granted, this is, this is an old study. Um, in a double-blind placebo-controlled study in Italy, in people with confirmed cases of Alzheimer's, those who took aniracetam for six months had improved memory compared to their baseline, uh, and then the placebo can, can, continued to decline. So uh, let's say everyone started here with their memory, and they have Alzheimer's disease. So you'd expect their memory to go down over the course of six months. And that's what we see in the placebo group. The placebo group start here, their memory goes down over six months. That's as expected. The aniracetam group, their memory went down as expected, and then it leveled off and then it improved. So at the end of the study, their memory was better than at the beginning. Well, that's phenomenal because we'd expect, I mean, even if it just stayed the same, or if it got less bad, and you know, current, uh, many current, al some current Alzheimer's drugs say it just, you know, it slows down the progress of Alzheimer's a little bit, right? Maybe 25%. And that's, that's great. Um, but, uh, but these other things can, can, some of them have shown to, to do much better than that. Um, and not just anorastin, but many, um, many natural supplements um, like curcumin, for example. I have a question have on this benefit. before we finish with this. So is this something that they're using routinely in, you know, are conventional no. doctors using this? No. So this research, I think if I remember correctly, is it from 1983? It's from a while ago or, might, or maybe 1991. Uh, there's research from the 80s in the United States on aniracetam and Alzheimer's. And then this research is from the 90s. Despite its positive results, there has not been a lot of funding for aniracetam research. In the United States, aniracetam is available without a prescription. It is an unscheduled pharmaceutical. So that means it's legal to buy, it's legal to sell, and it's legal to possess. You can't make claims about it and sell it because uh, it's not FDA approved for anything. By the way, no supplement is FDA approved. The FDA doesn't approve supplements, just like the FDA does not, I mean, they just don't approve supplements regardless of whether or not they work, regardless of whether or not they have a benefit. So anorastam is not FDA approved um, and pharmaceutical companies don't wanna pay for clinical trials, I'm guessing, because they can't patent it. And so they just prefer to ignore it or maybe they don't know about it um, and then research other drugs that have lots of side effects and are relatively costly and aren't nearly as beneficial. So, um, so in, in Europe, you can get a prescription for this. In the United States, you can find it uh, you can search online. You can search by aniracetam and or you buy spell aniracetam. It? Can you spell it for us? It's spelled A-N-I-R-A-C-E-T-A-M. Okay. Uh, by aniracetam US and see what's there. Um, and of course, you want to check with your doctor. This is this is a pharmaceutical. This is not like curcumin. This, there, there are counterindications for this. Um, and the, the studies are are really impressive. They're just, there aren't a lot because there's just not a lot of funding for it. Um, it's, oh, it's also impressive for a uh, traumatic brain injury re recovery and a stroke. So they'll, they'll give mice a, a traumatic brain injury. They'll, they'll hit their heads and then they'll give them aniracetam. Uh, mice given aniracetam remember the maze better than mice given a traumatic brain injury and not given aniracetam. So it can help with memory recovery after traumatic brain injury or concussion. Um, I think this, uh, similar with stroke and then something called scopolamine. Scopolamine is a, um, it's used for uh, anesthesia. And so um, it's thought that, you know, general people who go undergo general anesthesia, so surgery, they often lose their memory or they lose some of their memory. I'm sure some of us know people who went in for a surgery and had general anesthesia and they came out differently and they, just did, they, they didn't get their memory back. Um, aniracetam may help with that as well. Most anesthesi most anesthesiologists, I, I actually, uh, I, I shared this with a friend of mine who's an anesthesiologist. She said, show me the data. I want to write a paper with you on this. This is really cool. Um, so all kinds of benefits of aniracetam. It's relatively inexpensive 
compared to pharmaceutical drugs, but compared to supplements, it is expensive and it's, it's difficult to find, but really impressive research on this. And my hope is that, um, you know, a lot more people learn about this because it's extremely, um, generally speaking, extremely safe and very beneficial, also great for ADHD. Um, so attention deficit disorder, it, a lot of the drugs focus on dopamine. Dopamine's involved in focus, memory, and attention, motivation, also pleasure. Um, Anorastam is on acetylcholine, which is uh, more involved in memory. Bo bo both are important. So this can be complementary or synergistic with many ADHD meds because ADHD meds are working on dopamine and this helps increase acetylcholine. I find when I was taking Adderall regularly, when I'd take anorastam with my Adderall, not giving medical advice, when I would do that, I was much more pleasant. I was really kind of a jerk just taking Adderall. <laughs> I just, I, I, I wanted to do my research. I didn't, I didn't want to talk to people. Uh, you know, my, my girlfriend said, I, t I can tell you took Adderall. You're, you're not being nice to me. I'm like, wow, this, this isn't, this isn't good. Um, but the anorastam really kind of leveled me out. I was much more pleasant, uh, and enjoyable to, to be with. So that, that's, that's a, that's a controversial one that's worth searching. Um, and the, the reason you, I would recommend going to Google scholar and searching anorastam and reading some papers on it. It's really impressive. Um, and, I, and this is this next one is called a peptide. Um, I know we're bouncing around from supplements to pharmaceuticals to peptides, but I want to give people a taste of kind of what's available out there, hopefully spark their interest into, into doing some research and finding out what's available and what could be helpful. So there's lots of supplements, cinnamon, curcumin, lion's mane, um, you know, bacopa, lot, lots, lots of herbs that, that are really good for the brain. And then, um, you know, anorastam is a pharmaceutical. And then cerebrolysin is what's called a peptide. Peptides are short chain amino acids that are naturally found in the body. And they've been isolated and reintroduced into the body for tremendous health benefits. So there are peptides for weight loss. There are peptides for, um, peptides for increasing human growth hormone, peptides for improving sleep, peptides for suppressing appetite, peptides for increasing burning of fat, peptides for brain health, peptides for sexual vitality. And uh, one medical doctor mentioned on her podcast that peptides may replace approximately 70%, 70% of pharmaceutical drugs. Why? Well, because this is the body's internal pharmacy, right? This is taking things that are naturally occurring in the body and reintroducing them into the body. And so these have fewer side effects and the body knows how to handle them, right? So if I take Adderall, which is basically amphetamine, this increases dopamine activity in my brain and I can focus better, but there's all kinds of side effects because amphetamine is not naturally occurring in my brain. And so my body's got to figure out how do I get rid of it and so forth. And it can have side effects because of that. Peptides, on the other hand, when taken correctly, the body knows what to do with them and can easily dispose of them. And so they, they don't have the negative side effects that a lot of pharmaceuticals do. Great. So, so yeah. Does that, does that make sense? The, the difference of a peptide versus a pharmaceutical? Oh, pharmaceutical? absolutely. Absolutely. And how do people find these peptides? Uh, so you want to find, um, uh, you want to get them prescribed to you by a doctor who can prescribe peptides. So a compound pharmacy can make peptides. Interesting. I contacted compound pharmacy. They said they are not allowed. To, they said they're not allowed to make cerebrolysin. This one I'm about to tell you about. Um, so a compound pharmacy can make them, uh, and a doctor can prescribe them. So you, if you, if you go to a doctor who's educated on peptides, uh, they can prescribe peptides to you and they'll write you a script from usually to a compound pharmacy. So cere uh, cerebrolysin, this is a really interesting one because it is available in Europe. Uh, my understanding is I heard this from a compound pharmacist. She said that in Europe, you will get cerebrolysin at the, uh, at the emergency room. If you, if you come in with a traumatic brain injury. So let's say you get, so let's say a person gets into a car accident and they show up at the ER, they'll give them an infusion of cerebrolysin right there to help prevent uh, further brain injury and to help stimulate brain repair. Hmm. Uh, same thing with stroke. So this it's, it's actually common in, in Europe. These peptides are more available in the United States. Um, cerebrolysin. Uh, so what cerebrolysin does is it increases growth factors in the brain. These are, these are, um, 
what these do is they basically facilitate the growth and repair of the brain. Uh, one of my favorites uh, is brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF. This facilitates the growth of new brain cells and new neural connections. By the way, exercise increases BDNF, and so does lion's mane. So BDNF, very good for maintaining a healthy brain and repairing a brain and, and improving memory. So cerebral lysine increases that and increases nerve growth factor, increases a bunch of growth factors in the brain. Um, it's like lion's mane on steroids, or it's like exercise on steroids. It's really great for the brain. Um, it's difficult to get in the US, but you can, you can get it. Um, and so I'm not sure who, who has it, um, but it, 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 is, it is available for people who do, um, let's say if someone's gonna do a glutathione uh, infusion, and I, I hope I'm not getting too much in the weeds and like technical words. So glutathione is the body's master antioxidant. And uh, glute Dr. Dale Bredesen shared that glutathione cleanses can help reduce heavy metals in the body and help improve memory for those that have like brain fog from heavy metals. So you basically go into a doctor, they hook you up to a, an IV and they, and you get glutathione pumped through your body, a bunch of antioxidants through your body. That's really helpful. Um, a, a similar procedure would getting, would be getting cerebral lysin. Um, I haven't gotten cerebral lysin myself, but I'm guessing that's what the procedure looks like. And this can be really, really beneficial for the brain. So, so, the, so what we just talked about were number one, supplements, which are not, um, not, not FDA approved because the FDA doesn't approve them. You know, curcumin is very helpful, uh, for example. And then, pharm then aniracetam is a pharmaceutical that's extremely safe for healthy adults and is shown to improve memory in both healthy adults and in those with Alzheimer's disease in studies. Um, that's a little bit hard to find. And then cerebral lysin, uh, you're going to want to go through a uh, prescription and, and get a prescription for that if you're interested. And, um, and, th and that can be really, really good for the brain. So that's a peptide. And then please keep your eye out on peptides. These are cutting edge uh, medicine and longevity medicine. They're great for the brain. There's so many healthy peptides. Uh, the challenge with peptides is that they're not patentable because they naturally occur in the body. And so big pharma is not interested in selling them. And they're actually, they actually are financially motivated I don't know what their moral motivation is, but the financial motivation of this large industry is to not allow people to have peptides, I'm guessing, um, because they would need less pharmaceutical drugs. For people listening, what should they be looking for as they're getting older? Like what signs and symptoms, you know, should, I mean, anybody could go on curcumin, that's something, but in terms of where would you say people need to start taking, and all the steps you told us before that, maximizing sleep and your diet and your exercise. And I think that's so exciting that BDNF, the biggest thing is exercise. So everybody Absolutely. exercise. Yeah. And I'm such exercise a beats peptides too. Uh, <laughs> a friend of mine told me he was at a peptide conference and this, uh, this, this good looking doctor goes up on stage, really fit says, who wants to know the best peptide for the brain? Everyone says, yes. He says, it's exercise. Exercise beats everything. If you're not exercising, you're mixing that, missing out on the biggest opportunity for health, wellness, longevity, uh, dementia prevention, uh, you know, slowing down aging, all, all kinds of things, bone health, bone density. Um, oh, another, another supplement uh, that, that people are really interested in is collagen. Um, research shows that collagen peptides. So research shows that women who take collagen, um, they have denser, they have stronger muscles and denser bones than um, women who do not take collagen. Collagen also improves the, the, the skin health. Excuse me, um, our skin, hair and nails are also made out of collagen. And so by taking collagen, um, people can also look uh, younger as well. So all kinds of benefits of collagen for bone health, for muscle health and for skin health. Yeah, I'm such a big advocate of, and research has been done on that in terms of bone health, which is wonderful. And so, so, but people listening, um, what should they be looking for as they're aging? And, you know, is it, again, I agree with you, all the lifestyle things, all of us should be doing, but some of the other ones that you said that are prescription, should people wait and, and either if they have a family history, like who do you recommend then goes in that direction? If they have a family history, it's a really good idea to get tested for the APOE4 gene, specifically APOE4 allele. Uh, having one version of the, having ha whether or not someone has zero copies, one copies, or two copies, that's just helpful to know. Um, one copy uh, increases the risk uh, significantly, and then two copies greatly increases the risk. Like you really want to get started now. 
Um, so there's a, there's a movie star who plays Thor. I don't remember his name. Um, he has two copies and he learned that. And it was, um, he said, I'm going to take time off from my movie career and work on my health. And that's probably the right thing for him. Hopefully he has a, a nice amount of uh, money saved up from his work and he can devote uh, a couple of years to really getting his health in order so that he can uh, prevent Alzheimer's disease because he's, he's at substantial risk. Um, so, so you want to know your genetic risk. That's really helpful. And something else to look for uh, is, I forget what the test is called, but it's basically, you know, can you get up without touching the, touching the floor with your hands? So you can, can you stand up and sit down without uh, using your hands? Um, the, the, the less kind of use, use, the less you need to use your hands, kind of the, the better you are. And so I'm going to, I'm, I'm not wearing professional pants here, but I don't, I don't know if I can show this. Um, no, it's not you mean work get, oh, that's Basically, okay. So you mean getting up from sitting, um, having on, on the, the floor, sitting on the floor without using your hands, they've shown a correlation right. with that. And can, can you do, can you do that? Cause that that's about mobility, um, and, and flexibility. And so that's a good thing. So you can practice doing that. Another, another two things, two things to look for. Oh, this is a great study. Um, uh, it's got a cool name too. So this is a research in twins. It's called kicking back cognitive aging leg power predicts cognitive aging after 10 years in older female twins. And so what this, what this study did was it brought, uh, brought twins in the, into the laboratory, both monozygotic and dizygotic twins. So fraternal and identical twins. And they measured their memory. They measured their leg strength. Uh, they did a brain scan. You know, do you smoke? Uh, you know, what's your income and so forth? And then they had them go away and had them come back 10 years later, same battery of tests. What they found was that leg strength predicted their risk of Alzheimer's disease um, and the health of their brain. The twin with the stronger leg, stronger legs was less likely to be at risk for Alzheimer's and, and had a healthier brain. Wow. So do they attribute strength. that to the exercise, the um, incredible factors of exercise or the question of why goes beyond the scope of the study. The, the only thing the study can say is the twin with the stronger legs had a healthier brain. And so it's a good idea to work on your leg strength, whether that's because they, I, I think exercise frequency was controlled. I'd have to look at the study again. Um, and so we'll, we'll say it's, it's more about leg strength than exercise frequency, though certainly leg strength is undoubtedly associated with exercise frequency. Mm. So, so work those legs. If you can't do a squat, do a chair squat, right? Squat over a chair, sit down, stand back up, sit down, stand back up. That's really important. Also hand strength. Hand strength is extremely important. Um, hand strength helps us prevent falls and falls are one of the biggest risk factors for, um, for, for those who are for, for the elderly, uh, because one serious fall can really make a huge difference. And so preventing falls is tremendously important. And so a strong uh, hand grip allows you to catch yourself uh, if, you're, if you're slipping or brace yourself on the ground and so forth. And so you really want strong hands and strong legs, and you really want to exercise for function and mobility, right? Um, and so you know, now you're exercises. talking, now you're talking my language. I have everybody every single day doing balance exercises because it's key. No one wants a hip fracture. And once you, you know, avoiding falls is and preventing falls is so huge. But, you know, once you have a hip fracture and you're in the hospital, there's so many complications that include, you know, in terms, it's, it's one of the worst things for your, for your mental state when you're hospitalized and, you know, 25, almost 25% of people die within a year after the fracture. So yes, I so agree. We want to prevent those fractures. So, so for people listening in terms of what are some signs that it's not okay, that you need to, need to take action that, you know, this is like, oh yeah, I just go into a room and I forget something like what are signs people should be looking for that maybe they should get more evaluation and seek help. That's a really good question. Um, and so how's your memory? Are, are you experiencing brain fog or memory loss? Is your, does your spouse tell you that, that you're, you're experiencing brain fog or memory loss? Hopefully the spouse is being truthful with you and not just trying to get away with things. Um, that, that's important to know. 
Um, and so just here are a number of things that can cause brain fog, which can contribute to the risk of, of Alzheimer's disease because it can snowball, right? If we just, if, if we have a fuzzy brain for a day, it can become a week and then a month and then, you know, three years of fuzzy brain. Well, now we're, now we identify as, as having a risk as, as having a bad brain. It's really terrible. So, um, poor sleep contributes to brain fog, overwork, overstress, dehydration, or a lack of salts. So if people are um, exercising a lot and drinking a lot of water, but not replenishing salts, that can matter. So you can, if, if that's you, you can take a pinch of Celtic sea salt, put that in your water, that can be helpful. So you wanna make sure you have enough electrolytes and then enough water. Some people end up in the emergency room with um, you know, having brain fog issues or memory loss issues when it's really a matter of dehydration. And so getting those things taken care of can make a, can make a big difference. So addressing brain fog when it comes up, um, other things to, other things to look for. Yeah. Is, is your memory going? And that's, it's a good idea just to be, um, you know, Dr. Dale Bredesen recommends a cognoscopy, um, and you can basically take online memory tests to see how you're doing. Um, I have a free FDA, um, approved, it's an FDA certified memory test, uh, that compares people to someone of your age. And how is your, um, and how's your memory? How's your reaction time? How's your processing speed compared to someone of your age? So this is the first step I take with, with clients or potential clients. I'll say, Hey, you think, you think you have a problem with memory, please take this free test and then we'll go over it with you. And then some of them are, they're actually performing quite well. They're actually at average or above. They just, um, maybe their memory is slipping, but it's not, it's not bad relative to someone their age. Can you Other give us the link for that? Can you give us the link for that test? Let me see. What's the best way to Is do it just that? going on your website? What's the best way? So if someone goes to bettermemorysystem.com. And I'll put this in the show that's notes where you, as well. That's where you, I have a free masterclass on how to prevent Alzheimer's disease. And it's based in science. And so they can sign up for the masterclass there. And then after the masterclass, if they want to sign up for a free memory test, they, they, can, they can do that. Um, and th th these free memory tests, they're not for everyone because um, a member of my team is going to go over the results with you. So there's, there, there's a cost on my end. Um, and so if you're just taking it for fun, um, you know, you can find other online memory tests, but if you really think you have a memory issue, uh, first of all, please everyone watch the free masterclass that I put together. It's 40 minutes of science about, uh, behaviors you can do, foods you can eat, supplements you can take to help prevent Alzheimer's and then help slow the progression of Alzheimer's if someone already has it. And that's, that's totally free. And that's at bettermemorysystem.com. And then at the bottom of the masterclass, you can register for a, uh, a free memory test if you're concerned about your memory and you'd like to do something about it and you want to get tested. Okay. So to leave everyone, on, well, is there anything else that you want to share? I know there's so much information. I just wanted to let people know what's available. The research on some of these supplements is so exciting. The exercise, you know, all the pieces and that, that there's, it, things you can do to prevent it. That's not really known. You know, a lot of people just feel, oh, that's it. And, you know, I love the work of Dale Bradison. I have his book here. And I just think, you know, the more I hear and the more people that have been helped, it's, it, it, it's just fascinating and so exciting. And you just want to spread it and tell people Absolutely. There's, there's hope here. Is that what you've seen in your career now that you're, you're doing all these wonderful things? What have you seen? Yeah. A bunch of people say, you know, thank you for giving me hope. Because unfortunately, some medical doctors will hurt their patients by engaging the nocebo effect. This is the opposite of the placebo effect. The placebo effect is, Margie, take this pill and you're going to get better. And it's a sugar pill, right? And we use these in um, double-blind placebo-controlled studies to see what the impact is of the study drug or study supplement. And so, you know, a great thing for a doctor to do is, you know what, Margie, I think you can get better, do these things, and, and then you can get healthier. And that can help that can help you with this issue. That would be a great thing, assuming it's true. And it often is true. What many doctors do is they say, I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do. You have, you know, you have three weeks to live, you have six weeks to live, you have six months to live, what have you. Um, and they're they're taking away the opportunity for healing. They're reducing the opportunity for people to say, you know what, I can heal this. Um, and so that's called the nocebo effect. And so if someone were to take the article and anorassium to their doctor and say, Hey, 
I'd like to take this. What do you think of this? Is this safe for me? They say, oh, that stuff doesn't work. Well, have you read the research? Number one, I, you'd be fascinated how many uh, medical doctors or people representing medical doctors say su brain supplements don't work. I said, really? Have you read the thousands of research papers on so many different supplements from curcumin to lion's mane to magnesium and, and how beneficial they are for both animal studies and human studies? And you're telling me all of those studies are fake or wrong? I mean, what are you telling me? So the, people make these bl blanket statements that disempower the patient. Uh, it'd be great if doctors said, you know what? I don't, if they said, I don't know more and then empowered the patient said, I believe you can heal yourself. I believe there are things you can do to get better. This is just the, you know, you know, my look at your x-ray says this is a problem and you can do something about it. I really believe you can. I would start with these things and these other things may help. So the, so please don't allow the nocebo effect. Don't allow any anyone to tell you you can't do something to improve your health because I, I really don't think that's true pretty much regardless because there's so many miraculous healings for, for so many different conditions. We don't know how they work, um, but people heal themselves uh, many times. Um, and so I think it's important to, to not it, seek, seek a second opinion. If you have early stage Alzheimer's, the doctor says, oh, there's nothing we can do about this. Get another opinion. That doctor's not familiar with the, with the current science. Um, and so, so one, I want people to, to advocate for their, for their healing. Say, no, doctor, I believe I can heal myself. I believe if I exercise right and sleep and with the love and support of my family, with the love and support of my prayer group, whatever it is, I think I can get better. And I want to find a medical practitioner who's going to help me do that. Um, and number two, uh, and also I'd like to, I'd like to share just a few rapid fire supplements uh, with you. We went into the weeds a little, where I went into the weeds, excuse me, about curcumin and anorastam and cerebral lysin. Um, and I want to share a couple of just really basic supplements that are very easy to understand. So first is the, is the combination. These, these two supplements together can reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease by 30%. And that's, this is from research from Dr. Um, David Smith at Oxford. And the two supplements are fish oil and a B complex vitamin. Not, and, and so it's interesting, research, research on fish oil alone, the results were mixed. Does it prevent Alzheimer's or not? Some studies, yes, some studies, no. Same thing with B complex, some studies, yes, some studies, no. When you combine them, yes, benefit, right? So take both fish oil and a B complex vitamin. Uh, the B complex vitamin I like is by Thorne. It's, I find, actually, it's, it's by Garden of Life. I find that's most gentle on my stomach. Thorn also makes a good B-complex vitamin. I'm not, I don't have a financial relationship with either of those companies at this time. Um, and you want, you want to look for a methylated B-complex vitamin. So, so that's great. And B vitamins B6, 9, and 12 are necessary for a healthy brain and to make uh, neurotransmitters. And so you want to make sure you get plenty of that. And it's very difficult to overdose on a B-complex vitamin. You'd really have to try to take too much. Um, so those two, fish oil and B-complex. Um, another one is magnesium. Uh, research shows uh, in, in dissections of brains the, of, of patients with Alzheimer's disease, the Alzheimer's brain has less magnesium in it than a healthy brain. And magnesium is so important, as you know, uh, for bone health. Uh, magnesium is involved in over 300 enzymatic processes in, in your body. And uh, according to the United States Department of Agriculture, approximately 70%, if I'm remembering 60 or 70% of Americans aren't eating enough magnesium rich foods, which means you know six out of 10 or seven out of 10 of us would likely benefit from a magnesium supplement. Um, I like magnesium glycinate. That's one of the most bioavailable forms of magnesium. And, um, and it's very safe. And then a lot of us are deficient in it. In it. I like to take it on, a, on an empty stomach to increase absorption. You don't want to take magnesium with calcium. They can compete for absorption. Um, so magnesium is great for bone health and brain health. And then lastly is one uh, called lion's mane. Lion's mane is, uh, is a medicinal mushroom used in ancient Chinese and Japanese medicine. And Western medicine is now just beginning to understand its benefit. Uh, monks would actually take it to meditate, uh, which is kind of cool. Uh, so lion's mane has a number of different benefits. Number one, it reduces inflammation. And so that helps protect the brain from inflammation. Also pr protects the body. It also supports a healthy immune system by reducing inflammation. So it protects the brain and supports a healthy immune system. Number three, lion's mane can improve memory by increasing something called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF. It's an important growth factor 
in the brain. Um, and lion's mane can help uh, grow new brain cells and new neural connections because it increases BDNF. By the way, great research from Dr. Elizabeth Gould at Princeton showing that adults, uh, adult mammals, uh, pretty much every adult mammal aside from bats can grow new brain cells, specifically in the hippocampus, the memory center of the brain. So age 90 and above, you can still grow new brain cells and you can definitely grow new neural connections and BDNF can help and you can get that exercise, lion's mane, cerebral lysin, really, really important. Um, and lion's mane, one of my favorite benefits is that it improves sleep. Um, it also helps with depression and anxiety. I get a little afternoon anxiety with my ADHD. I get some tension kind of built up in my body and lion's mane I found is very, very helpful for that. Um, so, so lion's mane is another terrific uh, supplement uh, that is really, really great for overall health. It's good for sleep. It's good for depression, anxiety, inflammation, and it's great for memory as well and brain fog. Uh, full disclosure, I have a lion's mane supplement and uh, so I'm, I'm very biased in my perspective on it, um, but lion's mane, just generally speaking, there's a lot of great research on lion's mane and tremendous benefit to the brain and body. And it was just oh, very oh. funny when we met at a, we met at a, um, a weekend and there was, there was a scavenger hunt that, was, that we were all doing. And so we all had samples of your lion's mane to take and it really, so that we could really focus. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's what we wanted. Absolutely. So it helped oh, everybody I, really focus on this major scavenger hunt. <laughs> I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this. Mushrooms, edible mushrooms are terrific for the brain. Research out of Singapore of 663 people found that those who ate two to three servings of mushrooms a week had a 40% reduction in their risk of Alzheimer's disease. And so, what mushrooms were these? These were edible, the, these were just regular mushrooms? Yeah, the research did not specify, it did not say reishi, shiitake, button, what have you. The research just says mushrooms. Uh, please do cook your mushrooms for safety purposes, but just eat lots of mushrooms. Mushrooms are tremendous for your brain. We don't quite understand why. Um, and they're terrific for you. And so they're high in fiber, they're high in nutrients and they're great for your brain. And so, you know, if you can try to have them most dinners that you cook at home, um, there's also these mushroom chips that are less healthy because they are, uh, lightly fried in canola oil. Um, but they're absolutely delicious that like <laughs> these, are, these are going to replace potato chips. I hope a large company makes a really healthy version of this because they're so good. Like these mushroom chips are just so crazy good. They're, they're, they're these little shiitake mushrooms. Like instead of eating potato chips, you're eating these. They're so great. I guess you could make your own. I just I'll tell them in a little. <laughs> I love mushrooms. In terms of people, what what I, I know your supplement, what is the dosing though you recommend for the lion's mane? So that's a little tricky um, because different supplements have different concentrations. And so I recommend just on any supplement, follow the directions on the bottle. I want to make sure that you're safe. I, my lion's mane is a low dose lion's mane. My lion's mane is a mixture of 10 medicinal mushrooms, not just lion's mane. It's reishi, shiitake, maitake, turkey tail, cordyceps, lion's mane. Um, and these mushrooms work synergistically together to improve memory, uh, to reduce stress, improve sleep, uh, and just improve overall health. And people are getting great results uh, on it. And people write me, you know, I haven't slept this well in years, which I just, I just love. I'm so, I'm so heartened by that. That just feels really good. Because there's, um, you, so can buy, you can buy the teas, but they're not nearly the same concentration, correct? As the, as the um, supplement. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I will eat lion's mane mushrooms. You can get it as an edible mushroom and it's a lot easier just to, just to take a supplement. It's less expensive and it's easier just to take a supplement than it is to eat mushrooms every day. Now I'm not saying don't eat mushrooms every day. That's a great idea. Do eat mushrooms every day if you like. Um, and, and it's easier when you travel and it's just, it's just easier to, to take a supplement and that, that way, you know, you're getting the right dosage. Same thing with curcumin. People say, can I just cook with turmeric? Yes. You're not going to get the amount of curcumin that you want just cooking with turmeric. You would have to eat curry for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, <laughs> it, it's just, it's so much easier just to take a curcumin supplement. It's just, it's distilled down nutrition for you. You know, I kind of equate supplements to magic in that they're concentrated nutrition that is so powerful for you, so powerful for your health. And it's so inexpensive, right? The amount of labor that would be required to, to, you know, to grow the turmeric root, to, to water it and to take care of it. And then 
harvest it and then process it and then distill it down, isolate the curcumin and then put it in this capsule. I don't know what that is. It's immense. And you're getting that concentrated nutrition for a couple for, you know, 50 cents to, you know, $2 of a capsule. That's tremendous. And it would take us so long to try to extract that kind of nutrients uh, from the, from the, from the herb ourselves. And if you want to grow your own turmeric, great. But uh, you know, there's, there's really helpful supplements out there that are very, make, make it very easy for us to get the concentrated nutrition. Another one is, is uh, matcha. So matcha is like green tea on steroids. Do you know about matcha, Margie? I do. Yeah. So it's got a little bit of a bitter taste. I like to add it to my smoothie because it's, I don't, I don't like to drink it personally. Um, so research out of Japan found that those who drank two cups of green tea a day had a 43% reduction in their symptoms of dementia. So two cups of green tea a day, 43% reduction in symptoms of dementia. Matcha is like 10 times the antioxidants of green tea. And so that's great. And so if you can add a little bit of matcha powder into your food or your smoothies, or maybe drink matcha, that's another great way to take, to, to get a lot of antioxidants. So just these antioxidant rich, rich um, spices, you know, and it's interesting, you know, the Silk Road, um, you know, people travel, I don't know how many miles, I'm guessing it's thousands. I don't think it's just hundreds. I think it's thousands of miles on the, on the Silk Road. Um, the way they travel months on the Silk Road, very dangerous to bring back spices from, uh, from the East to Europe. Um, and those spices were so dense in these antioxidants, these bright colors, the cinnamon, the curcumin, um, you know, the saffron, uh, all, all these, all these spices, and they were really, really expensive spices, uh, you know, coming from the silk road had to be tremendously expensive. You know, people died on the silk road. People were, you know, held up at knife point to take their cargo. And now you can get these, you can get these tremendous herbs uh, or, or these at, or these or supplements containing herbs like cinnamon or, or curcumin at the grocery store for pennies on the dollar. I mean, you know, the, we, didn't, we didn't have to travel the Silk Road here. It's, it's amazing the, the, the blessing it is to be alive today where we got Mozart on our phone anytime we want to, you know, open up YouTube or Spotify. And we got, you know, we got healthy herbs and foods from around the world and supplements uh, at the grocery store with very, with very little effort. It's just, it's a wonderful time to be alive, uh, to stay healthy and to really, and we're, we're so blessed with the, with the rich media that we have. If we ignore the, the media that's stressful and just choose the beautiful books and movies and music that's available, it's really just a tremendous time to be alive. Wow. Well, you're just a wealth of information. So when people want to even expand more, they'll have to look, they can watch your free masterclass. And so any, anything you want to just leave us with before we end? Because we could talk for hours. There's so much information. Well, I'm, I'm just honored to be here with you. And I just, I really want to share the message that there are things you, there are things you can do to reduce the risk of Alzheimer's. And then Alzheimer's is not destiny. If you have a diagnosis or genetics is not destiny, excuse me. Even if someone tests positive for the APOE4 gene, which does increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease, that's not your destiny. Uh, I like to say that Alzheimer's is approximately 20% gene genetic, 80% behavioral. And so it's 80% in your court, right? It's, it's about the exercise. It's about the diet. It's about the sunshine. It's about the sleep. It's about getting lots of hugs. Hugs are great. They reduce stress. They increase oxytocin and they're a wonderful part of life. Um, you know, doing these continued learning, uh, listening to podcasts like this that help expand your mind. Um, these, these behaviors are really what's going to make the difference in, in someone's future and in their future health. And, and so I just, want to leave the message of hope there there are things you can do there's scientifically validated things you can do and so and then a lot of them are fun you know I, I like eating mushrooms i like going for jogs in the morning i like listening to mozart you know there's i like learning things you know there's so many travel travel's wonderful um so many wonderful things we can do that are enjoyable that are also great for great for our brain yeah i love that so for everybody tell people about you have a really interesting tiktok and tell everybody about your a little bit about your social media. I was on that. It was really fun. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yes, I I, I was in, I interviewed Margie for my my uh, my TikTok crowd. That was just that was just great. Um, so I have a TikTok and Instagram account uh, that has a fair amount of followers. My TikTok has over a million followers, and my Instagram has just over a hundred thousand followers. And I post uh, short videos about 
things someone can do to improve their health, uh, slow down aging and reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease. And so if that's helpful uh, and you'd like that, uh, my, my handle is just my name, Robert W. B. Love. So Robert and then W and then B. Love. And that's my handle on TikTok, Instagram, also Facebook and YouTube. And I post free content there. And then if you want to learn more about me or my supplements or um, you know, the other companies I work with, uh, you can find information there as well. And, and then please, please watch the free masterclass. Uh, you do need to register for it. Uh, so just, if you just, if you go to Rob, if you go to bettermemorysystem.com into your name, email, uh, phone number is optional, and then, uh, it'll take you to the masterclass. Oh, great. Well, thank you for sharing all this and everybody, this is so encouraging because, there's so much. And that's what I always believe. I always believe never accept. You dig deep and we figure this out because there's so much to do. But I love the work that you're doing and really making a difference and letting people know there is hope and there's so much you know available. And so I think it's it's just very empowering to know this. So thank you so much for joining me here today. My pleasure, Margie. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Dr. Love and realize there's so much we can do to keep our brains strong and healthy and help prevent Alzheimer's. And the good news is the things that we can do for our brain are also amazing for our bones. So it's just a win-win situation. All the links that Dr. Love talked about will be in the show notes. And also in the show notes is the link for my new membership program, the Happy Bones Club. So make sure to check it out. We have so many great experts coming and great information, and I would love you to be part of it. So thanks so much for tuning in, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode.